whenever something providential happens, I just look up and say, thank you, Lord. I know that was you or it was one of your angels on assignment. It's important to review what the Bible says about the aid of angels because we live in a dangerous world and we need all the help we can get. Concerning angels, Hebrews 1.14 declares, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who shall inherit salvation? That's you and me. The fact that angels are described as ministering spirits implies activity and specifically activity for believers. We believers and those destined for salvation are the beneficiaries of angelic aid. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Shalom, I'm Christine Darg. The people in the Bible had no trouble believing in the existence of spiritual beings, angels, fallen angels, demons. Bible heroes were well aware of invisible helpers who were doing God's bidding and sympathizing with his children. The Amplified of Hebrews 1.14 declares, are not all the angels ministering spirits sent out by God to serve, to accompany, to protect those who will inherit salvation? Of course they are. Angels are ministering spirits divinely commissioned to help certain individuals, those destined to obtain everlasting salvation. Of course, this implies that being saved is of primary importance. The unsaved are not promised any angelic help. Now, since the text says angels are sent to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation, perhaps we should review what happened to us before we were saved. Were you ever on the brink of ruin? Did the hand of God somehow rescue you? And if you have not yet made a commitment to follow the Lord Jesus, perhaps you should review close scrapes in times when your life was hanging by a thread, and yet something happened, and you escaped. The Bible clearly teaches that God sends angels on rescue missions, and he also sends angels as his messengers from time to time. Truth is, we're surrounded by invisible forms. According to Matthew 4, 11, angels ministered to our Lord after his temptation and fasting in the wilderness. And also according to Luke 22, 43, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him during his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane prior to his terrible ordeal of flogging and crucifixion. Furthermore, angels watched his grave, witnessed his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. These celestial beings avert danger in the path of duty and deliver the heirs of salvation from many evils. Jesus chose not to be delivered from his mission on the cross because he knew he was destined to die as the Lamb of God for the sins of the world. Nevertheless, he said he could have called upon myriads of angels who were available in the shadows. In fact, in Matthew 26, 53, he said he could have called upon 12 legions of angels, thus comparing angel armies to Roman armies. A legion at full strength was approximately 6,000 Roman soldiers. So taken literally, Jesus said God the Father could send 72,000 angels to defend him if he had asked. When I was 15 years old, I was involved in a train wreck. It was a good thing that I had already received a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus because the accident happened so quickly that should I have died, I would not have had time to repent. But my life was spared for a purpose, and God sent an angel to watch over me until the ambulance arrived. My maternal grandmother was once very worried because my grandfather was deathly ill and she was afraid he would die 
and leave her to raise their three children alone. But an angel appeared to her and comforted her, saying, Not now. And indeed, my grandfather did precede my grandmother in death, but only after he had lived to old age. The Bible admonishes us to walk by faith, not by sight. Just because we can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist, of course. From cover to cover, the Bible teaches that angels are real and active. They are also innumerable and immortal. Angels are employed in continual adoration of God, yet they're also sent on errands to help God's people in emergencies. And the Bible never says that angelic services have ceased. There are many modern testimonies of angels continuing to render very important and comforting services to believers and to the nation of Israel, which is destined to obtain salvation in these last days. In all of Israel's wars, there are testimonies of angelic help. During the War of Independence, Jews fought the Jordanian military for Mount Zion and found themselves surrounded by hundreds of soldiers. The Jews were outgunned, and they had only 25 bullets left. The Jewish platoon agreed to go out with a bang and readied themselves to make use of every last bullet. But then suddenly the Jordanians dropped their weapons and began running away, screaming the name Abraham, Abraham. They saw a vision of an angel resembling Abraham defending the Jews in the sky directly above the Israeli platoon. And so the Jordanians dropped their weapons and ran. According to the archives of the Israel Defense Forces, during the Yom Kippur War, a small, impossibly outnumbered Israeli force held back a large portion of the Syrian army for four days in a battleground known as the Valley of Tears in the Golan Heights. Just when the Israeli force was on the verge of collapse, the Syrians suddenly retreated. It's been theorized that the Syrians didn't know the tanks were out of shells, but a captured Syrian soldier swore that an army of angels had surrounded those few Israeli tanks. That could truly be exactly what happened, considering that the tiny modern nation of Israel is known as the miracle on the Mediterranean. Well, Psalm 34, 7 declares, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Also, Psalm 91, 11 declares, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. God's angels dwell in his court in heaven and behold his face continually. Yet the Lord has appointed them to attend on us and on the children. Let's praise and magnify God for providing these angelic guards for us. The patriarchs, the people of Israel, the prophets, the apostles, the saints in the Bible, our Savior himself, have been accompanied by angels in dangerous times. An angel was sent to Abraham on Mount Moriah to intervene in the near sacrifice of his son Isaac. Jacob wrestled all night with an angel. And when Jacob feared reunion with his belligerent brother Esau, God sent a host of angels to comfort Jacob and bolster him up. God sent an angel to deliver Israel out of Egypt and to guide them through the terrible wilderness. And when they called upon him, the angel of his presence was their deliverer. And when they entered the promised land, God sent an angel to drive out the Canaanites before them. An angel was sent to oppose the headstrong prophet Balaam. When God would destroy the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent three angels to tell Abraham. I don't doubt that God speaks to us now, and he did to his friend Abraham. And he saves men now from ruin as he saved Abraham's nephew Lot out of Sodom. When Elijah was fleeing from the evil queen Jezebel and was exhausted, an angel appeared to him and gave him food and drink for his journey. There's not a struggle of your soul which is not known to the Lord. Angels are also sent as executioners of God's wrath against his enemies. 
When the army of the king of Assyria besieged Jerusalem, God sent an angel who delivered the city and in one night struck down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. The angel Gabriel was sent as a messenger to the prophet Daniel, also to the priest Zacharias, who was father of John the Baptist, and to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Angels visited the shepherds in Bethlehem, and two angels appeared to the female disciples who visited the Lord's grave and announced to them that Jesus was risen. In Acts 12, 7, an angel opened prison doors to liberate the apostle Peter. And in Acts 27, 23, an angel visited Paul with an important message. So angels, the highest orders of created beings, serve God by ministering unto distressed believers, to little children, and afflicted saints. Furthermore, angels will have a role in the future as foretold in the book of Revelation. Presently, during the current dispensation in which we're living, the church age, angels are involved in the process of people being saved or born again, but believers are appointed by God as the primary preachers. In Acts chapter 10, for example, a God-fearing centurion named Cornelius was instructed by an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Jaffa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all of your household can be saved. So an angel appeared to Cornelius and gave him instructions on how to find a preacher. The angel said that Peter would tell Cornelius the gospel that would bring salvation to his household. It seems it would have been easier for the angel just to share the gospel message with Cornelius But, as I said, in this dispensation, God has declared that Christians should preach the gospel. However, once we enter into the period known as the Great Tribulation, which will be a different dispensation after the rapture of the church, then angels will assist in the preaching of the gospel. Revelation 14 and verse 6 and 7 teaches, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship the Creator. When the Lord returns, He will bring all of His holy angels with Him. How great must the King be to have such a retinue! We are warned in Holy Scripture not to worship angels. So, how do we become involved in the ministry of angels? Well, first of all, Scripture explains that angels are sent in response to fervent and persistent prayer. Consider when the Apostle Peter was imprisoned by King Herod. The account in Acts 12 of Peter's miraculous release from jail begins when an angel touched him and his chains fell off and the doors and gates just opened of their own accord. But this is because the church had been offering constant prayer to God for Peter. Yes, an angel was sent to deliver him in response to the continual prayer of the church. The Jewish rabbis speak of a particular angel for this purpose, whom they call the angel of prayer. Angels are surely present in worship services. The placing of the cherubim, in the Holy of Holies signifies the presence of angels in worship. And therefore, we are exhorted to behave with modesty and reverence, not only because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, but also out of regard for the presence of holy angels who are watching our deportment and behavior. Now, the second biblical key to accessing the ministry of angels is that God sends them when His Word is declared aloud. Psalm 103, verse 20 declares, Bless the Lord, you His angels who excel in strength, who do His word, heeding the voice of His word. When angels heed the voice of God's word, they go into action, bringing their strength to bear upon a situation. It's so important to therefore speak God's word aloud. Ephesians 6, 17 admonishes us to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, 
And in the Greek New Testament, the word logos basically means this collective word of God, this written Bible. But there's also a second word in Greek, meaning the spoken word of God, and that's the Greek word rhema. Rhema means the word of God when it is spoken out loud. When we fill our heart with his word and then proclaim it aloud, it becomes a mighty weapon against the powers of darkness. And as the Lord directs, the spoken word of God can release mighty angels into our battles. Of course, we have to exercise faith for these things to happen. For example, for many days, we prayed for the release of the hostages in Gaza. And we know angels were active and involved. In God's kingdom, there are various ranks or orders of angels, including the archangels. The great prince Michael stands up for Israel. Daniel 12, 1 reveals that in the end times, Michael will stand up, that great prince who stands watch over the Jewish people. And we're told there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. But Daniel 12, 1 prophesies God's people shall be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book. And Michael is the overseer, the guardian of the affairs of the Jewish people. They are especially under his protection. He was appointed by God to watch over them. The time of trouble prophesied in Daniel 12, 1 is the tribulation period spoken of by Jesus in Matthew 24 a chapter which outlines the wars, rumors of wars, birth pangs, uprising of various nations, and signs of the last days. It should be observed that the mere presence of Michael does not avert times of trouble, but rather he helps God's people during their trouble. Many believers have claimed in the past that the Nazi Holocaust fulfilled these prophecies of the end times. But the sadistic pogrom of the Hamas terrorists has been a real wake-up call. Israelis keep saying never again, but evil befell them again in a very brutal way on October the 7th when Hamas terrorists committed unspeakable murders in southern Israel. Furthermore, great trials for Israel are looming on the prophetic horizon. Some good news is that the commentaries on Daniel 12.1 teach that Severe trials bring superior sources of help. In fact, the name Michael in Hebrew means who is like God. God is mighty to save and to deliver. In eternity, saved souls will learn that our trials served our highest good. Our troubles drove us to God. Our troubles brought the revelation of His available help. And Israel's present troubles are driving the Jews home and causing them to put their trust in God alone. The great prince Michael shall defend Israel. Also, the commentaries teach that larger unfoldings of the truth are reserved for the end times in the future. In each succeeding age, men have had to admit, we've only known the plan of God in part. We've only prophesied in part. But in the end times, teachers will be multiplied and the words of God are sealed until the time of the end, as prophesied in Daniel 12, 9. The time of Antichrist will be a time of unparalleled distress. Trouble will be upon all earth dwellers. But the time of the Antichrist is the time when Michael, the great prince over the children of Israel, will stand up on their behalf. Hallelujah. Now, what about the subject of angels and death? I'm praying to be part of the rapture, but if we die before the rapture occurs, there is reason to believe that angels will minister to us in our dying moments. Jesus explained in Luke 16 in verse 22 that when the beggar Lazarus died, he was carried by the angels to Abraham's arms in paradise. So Jesus taught that angels are involved in our transference from earth to the afterlife. Celestial beings are our convoy. Scripture also gives us reason to believe that angels have some charge and care of the bodies of good men after death. And we gather this from Jude's little epistle, verse 9, which tells us that Michael disputed with the devil over the body of Moses. 
This we can be sure of, that the angels will be the great instruments in the resurrection of believers. For so our blessed Savior has told us in Matthew 24, 31, He will send His angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather His elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Furthermore, Jesus said that in the resurrection we will be like the angels in powers, dignity, service, holiness, and immortality. But the tenor of Scripture affirms that redeemed believers will in fact surpass the angels. This is because angels are servants. But on the other hand, our position as born-again believers is that we have been made to be sons and daughters. We are adopted. And therefore, according to Romans 8, 17, we are joint heirs with Messiah. Angels bow before the Lord's throne, but we are destined, so the scriptures teach, to sit with the Lord. How great are the heirs of salvation? And how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation as this? Now here's something fascinating also about angels. Hebrews 13.2 admonishes us, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. The commentaries say this allusion is probably to Genesis chapter 18, which records Abraham showing hospitality to a trinity of angels. And it alludes to Genesis 19, where Abraham's nephew Lot also entertained angels. The Greek word for angels means messengers and serves to remind us that strangers should be welcomed because they could be special messengers of God in disguise. For his faith and hospitality, a son was granted to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. And for his hospitality to angels, Lot's life was saved. The angels pulled him out of Sodom before its destruction. So what can we learn from these accounts in Genesis? The commentaries say that at any time, and when we least expect it, the visits even of our fellow men may be like visits of angels, messengers of God's purposes for good. In this regard, especially to be noted, are the Lord's words, that he who receives you receives me. And also, he said in Matthew 25, 40, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. So our Lord taught that we may entertain him, the king of angels, and yet be unaware that it's Jesus. In Matthew 25, he said, I was a stranger and you took me in, like Abraham did to God in Genesis 18.1. At first, the trinity of angels appeared as men to Abraham, and he treated them as such, but they were angels, and one of them was God the Father himself. Due to his hospitality, Abraham received the promise of his son Isaac. Also, Lot didn't know that his visitors were angels, but they were angels, and he was delivered by them from the burning of Sodom. Think about this. We're told that we have entertained Jesus himself when we have entertained members of his body. It's the same as if ministering to him. Matthew 25, 34 begins like this. Come, you blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then he said, the righteous will be astonished and answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. The sages teach that in hospitality, there are two things required. Number one, that we practice it frequently. 
The receiving of, of a stranger once doesn't make you a hospitable person. It must be a, a lifestyle, a character trait. And number two, it must be done willingly, without grudging, with whatever resources we happen to have. We must, as it were, pull them in like Abraham and Lot did. We must constrain them as Lydia did with Paul and Silas. In Acts 16, the Lord opened Lydia's heart to respond to Paul's gospel message. And then she persuaded them to come to her house, which became a house of worship. You see, God requires us to be hospitable, to be givers. Listen to Isaiah 58, 7. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. Well, our Bible heroes and heroines were hospitable, especially to the household of faith. Many a guest has proved to be like an angel, brightening up the home by their presence and leaving behind precious memories and saving influences. My parents were hospitable to missionaries who greatly impacted my life. Therefore, Hebrews 13, verses 1 to 3, exhorts us, Forget not to show love to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember the prisoners as, as if chained with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. And did you know that when a sinner repents and gives his heart to the Lord, the angels rejoice? Jesus said in Luke 15, 10, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. If you have never repented, I hope and pray that today you will repent and turn to God and the Lord Jesus as Savior. And this will cause rejoicing among the angels in heaven. Amen. Well, if you'd like to be a watchman on the walls with us, we invite you to stay in touch on social media and also to receive our free weekly updates. You can contact me at our website, exploits.tv. We also invite you to download our free Jerusalem Channel app through your favorite app store so you can see our videos on your mobile phones or, or tablets. And don't forget to check out my library of articles on Bible prophecy and news perspectives at Substack. Daniel 11.32 declares that people who know their God will be strong and carry out exploits. That means we're going to take action. Until next time, always contending earnestly for the faith and praying for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Darg. Shalom and Maranatha. Fast-changing developments in Israel in the Middle East keep us busy interpreting the spiritual significance of today's headlines. The Jerusalem Channel is taking advantage of the Substack website to post developments that you need to know about. Substack is a new kind of internet outlet for in-depth reporting and analysis that's completely uncensored and allows me to share insightful articles at all times of day and night. This is Christian journalism as it should be. We invite you to check out my Substack pages and find an understanding of Israel and Bible prophecy from my perspective. Just go to christinedarg.substack.com and be a part of our community. You'll also find an archive of all my articles. That's christinedarg.substack.com. Let's share what God is doing in these last days together.